This is the final part of a series of five programmes showing how Britain's railways have changed in the second part of the 20th century. During that time, the majority were in nationalised ownership under British railways, although a significant proportion remained in other hands. In this programme, we look at both sides of the fence, British railways and Britain's railways. It's easy to forget that British Railways was in existence for 48 years and that the big four, the Great Western, Southern, London, Midland and Scottish and London and North Eastern only existed for 25 years. This was just over half the life of BR itself. The change in nearly half a century has been dramatic, including the elimination of steam, pre- and post-beaching closures, the loss of important freight traffic to road haulage and long-distance passenger traffic to planes and cars. Our first subject neatly encompasses all these aspects. This is British Railways' first flagship project, the completion of an LNER scheme, the electrification of the famous Woodhead route. Most of the decline of the railway has mirrored the decline of Britain as a major industrial power, with the elimination of much heavy engineering, such as shipbuilding, steel making and coal mining. It was on the needs of these industries that the railway system was built up, most notably in the northeast and on both sides of the Pennines. The Manchester to Sheffield line via Woodhead first opened to traffic in 1845 under the auspices of the Sheffield, Ashton under Lyme and Manchester Railway. In 1846, this became the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway and in 1897, the Great Central. To avoid congestion at Barnsley, in 1880, a direct link was opened from Wath, where these massive marshalling yards would later be built, to Penistone, where we see a diesel multiple unit at the end of the 1970s, on the line from Sheffield. This brought traffic from the Yorkshire coalfield to Manchester. As early as 1926, the line through Woodhead was operating to capacity. To increase capacity, the solution was to electrify at 1500 volts direct current, with power fed by overhead catenary. Work was started on the electrification before the Second World War. This, unfortunately, was shelved due to hostilities, and it wasn't until September 1954 that the first passenger train left Sheffield for Manchester under electric haulage. The major work was boring a new three mile and 66 yard single bore tunnel through the Pennines. The previous tunnel had been twin bores. This was dangerous work and six people died in the process. The main power control centre was built adjacent to Peniston station. These trains are seen at either end of the new Woodhead tunnel. All the locomotives seen here are of class EM1 being Bobo freight locomotives, 58 of which were built for this line. The first was produced in 1941 to Sir Nigel Gresley's design for the London and North Eastern Railway, long before the railway that required it was ready. 57 further locomotives were built from 1950 onwards under the auspices of British Railways. These locomotives weighed in at nearly 88 tonnes and had a tractive effort of 45,000 pounds. Their maximum speed was 65 miles per hour. Some were fitted with train heating boilers for passenger working. One of the class built at Horwich, number 26020, has been preserved by the National Railway Museum. Another pair of EM1s climbs the 1 in 117 bank by the Woodhead Reservoir.
It seems incredible that after all the hard work and money involved with the modernization of this route, that on the 5th of January 1970, the last passenger train ran from Manchester Piccadilly to Sheffield, Victoria, one of the most dramatic post-beaching passenger route cuts. But even that faded into insignificance at the beginning of the 1980s, as 11 and a half years later, on the 18th of July 1981, the route was closed completely. This was 136 years after building, and only 27 years after electrification. Today there's very little to show where the Woodhead route once passed. Even the vast marshalling yards at Wath have gone. Once they resounded to round-the-clock shunting and the smell of coal was all-pervading. Hardly any artefacts of the railway age survive and landscaping is all the rage. Only the road bridge now crossing a railway desert remains. But for how long? Once there was a mine here as well, but that, the source of the railway's wealth, has also vanished without trace. Some traces remain of the line at Wurzborough, but in 1996 the trackbed was in the process of conversion into the railway's victor, a road. A burnt-out signal box alongside a single line of rails is all that remains of the original electrified line into Sheffield, at Deep Car. Penistone's massive signal box, elevated above the lines it once served, now has but two points and a few signals to control. This was the major junction on the electrified lines, with large marshalling yards on either side of the running lines, and also the junction for the rural line to Huddersfield. The latter, incorporating part of the line via Wurzborough to Wath, is all that remains today. Penistone Station is a crossing point, and trains consist of two coach pacer units. On the Woodhead line, a few artefacts survive. It's almost possible to envisage these buffer stops at Penistone West as marking the end of a busy goods yard, but they aren't connected to anything. The goods yard office buildings remain in BR ownership for a little while. A few miles further on, a crossing keeper's hut still stands sentinel over rails in the roadway. But again, they stand alone, connected to nothing. Well-built railway cottages remain, now comfortable private dwellings. The trackbed of the line, 15 years after closure, remains discernible. At these heights there's always a lot of wind, and modern windmills and wind farms have started to dominate the skyline. In this remote area, there's little call for the trackbed to be put to any alternative use, but the modern predilection for rambling and walking in the high fells has meant that parts of it have been converted to a footpath. At Dunford Bridge, the track bed remains as it was when the track was lifted, which was in the mid-1980s. When the line was closed, there was the usual vociferous campaign to retain it, and the result was an agreement to leave the track in place for five years in case traffic demands should lead to a renaissance. It never came. 
Today, the only parts of the line which see any commercial use are the original Woodhead tunnels, the modern one being sealed up upon closure. The original tunnels were handed over to the Electricity Generating Board to take underground power lines, as the hostile territory on top of the mountains isn't conducive to secure overhead power lines. It's ironic that this railway route should have been the first main line in the country to use overhead power lines. It's also ironic that the very fact of the Woodhead route's electrification was its downfall. As previously remarked, the need to electrify was identified in 1926. As it was a pioneering project, it was very complicated and only preliminary work had been undertaken when the war intervened. Immediately after the war, priority was given to remedial work rather than new projects. So, by the time British Railways was formed in 1948, no further progress had been made. The new nationalised organisation needed a flagship project to show it was in the vanguard of modern thinking. So, the Woodhead project was dusted off for completion. Further delays were caused by the decision, also partly inspired by their desire to show faith in the future, to cut a new tunnel, delaying the completion of the project until 1954. By that time, it was effectively 30 years old technology, and in the following year, it was announced that future electrification would use AC power at 25 kilovolts, thus rendering the brand new Woodhead electrification obsolete at a stroke. The Woodhead scheme had its origins, appropriately, in the northeast, the cradle of railways. The earliest railways were private affairs, built to take coal and minerals to staiths on the Tees and Tyne rivers for onward transport. One of these was the Harton Railway, which connected a mine at Westho to staiths on the south bank of the River Tyne. In the early days, electricity was entirely generated from coal, so electric power for railways was a logical move, as they would still effectively be powered by coal, the railway's staple commodity. The first railway electrification projects were undertaken in the first decade of the 20th century, the Northeastern Railway being amongst the pioneers. They undertook the first project where the needs of freight haulage were the primary causes of electrification. Within the northeastern sphere of operations, the Harton Railway undertook a similar project, their locomotives bearing a striking resemblance to those of the mainline concern. The Harton Railway fell into the hands of the National Coal Board at the end of the 1940s, and its unique form of traction remained in use until the 1980s, when, in common with the Woodhead route, it fell victim to the needs of modernization and the falling demand for coal. The first effect was that half of the system was to be operated by diesel locomotives, transferred from other pits which had been closed, thus avoiding the need to modernise the electric system. Therefore, in the late 1980s, the only part of the system to remain electrified was that seen here, where an unusual system was employed to position the wagons for unloading. By this time, too, the railway was no longer carrying coal, but merely colliery waste for disposal at sea. After collecting its train from the exchange sidings, where diesels gave way to electrics, the unique centre cab electric locomotive would take the train to a head shunt at the terminal, where it would reverse and propel them round to holding sidings, where it would be detached. The locomotive then ran back to the head shunt. Meanwhile, the wagons were allowed to run through the discharge building under gravity and would then run up into a further head shunt.
Still under gravity control, the empty wagons would then reverse and run onto the back of previously emptied wagons to form a train of empties. Finally, the electric locomotive, having run back to the head shunt, would return on the main running line and then set back onto the front of the empty wagons to form a train back to the exchange sidings, so the whole process could start all over again. In 1996, the only electrics to be seen at Westo are the Tyne and Weir metro trams. The exchange sidings where electrics gave way to diesels and vice versa have now given way to nature, as the Harton Railway is now a part of history. The colliery became part of the statistics of the 1990s as the destruction of the coal mining industry, presaged by the miners' strike of the 80s, took its inevitable toll. Today, just a few buildings remain to show where the trains once ran here. Although ships still tie up alongside Hart and Staithes on the River Tyne, they are no longer there to receive the products or by-products of Westo Colliery. A white painted wooden railing is the only point of reference for us today, marking the point where the wagons would reverse under the influence of gravity. Whilst the rest of the complex, this view panning round from the locomotive head shunt towards the empty wagon sidings, has disappeared completely. The tunnel through which the train arrived from the exchange sidings is bricked up. The raised portions of the sidings and the bridge which connected them and divided them from the locomotive shed have been flattened. This view is taken from where the raised sidings were. The original views of the shed in its working days having been taken from a vantage point which no longer exists. The buildings in the background and the remaining chimney are the only points of reference now. Not all artefacts from this pioneering railway have been obliterated, however. Two of the fascinating locomotives survive. Sadly, they will never run again. Not all of Britain's railways have disappeared. We now turn to one of the greatest systems of all, the railways that serve the capital city, London. Whilst the system as a whole is known as the underground, a large proportion is a conventional railway most notably on the appropriately named Metropolitan Line. London Transport electrified the line to Amersham in 1960. Before 1960, steam worked to Rickmansworth. 
in the latter days, K3 moguls, Stania 264 tanks and B1-460s worked the service to Aylesbury and beyond. The coaches of the Chesham shuttle dated from the turn of the century. The six coaches in use were survivors from a class of 54 vehicles built for the Metropolitan Railway. 24 were built by the Ashbury Carriage and Iron Company of Manchester. This gave rise to the coaches being called Ashburys. On the 6th of June 1971, London Transport retired its last steam locomotive. Here, number L94 passes Farringdon with the last train. She's an ex-Great Western pannier tank, number 7752. They were used on works trains and carrying rubbish to Croxley Tip. The pannier's duties were taken over by battery locomotives, converted from conventional underground stock. And one is seen here on a works train, working on the widened lines between King's Cross and Moorgate. A London transport train of Q-Stock approaches Wimbledon, where the London transport met the southern region of British Railways. The last coach is a driving trailer of R-Stock. This was the standard form of train on the Metropolitan Line from the 1930s until the early 1970s. The Q-Stock was withdrawn by London Transport in 1971. Another train of Q-Stock with its distinctive clear story roofs comes under one of the flying junctions which have been such a notable feature of the underground system. London Transport Electric No. 5 John Hampton hauls a special train past Neasden. These Bobo Metropolitan Railway electric locomotives weighed 56 tonnes. They were introduced in 1922, rebuilt from earlier locomotives. This engine was later to be preserved at the London Transport Museum at Covent Garden. These locomotives were 50 years old in 1972 and a special was run on the 16th of July to commemorate this. John Hampton, together with sister engine number 12, Sarah Siddons, topped and tailed the special of seven London Transport brake vans. For the princely sum of £3.75, the tour travelled from Acton Town via Uxbridge, Wembley Park, Watford, Amersham, Harrow, back through Uxbridge to Ealing Common. In addition to the preservation of John Hampton in the museum, Sarah Siddons, named after the famous Edwardian actress, is preserved in working order. The Metropolitan Railway now is little changed from the scenes of a quarter of a century ago, although trains no longer change locomotives at Rickmansworth. All trains consist of multiple unit stock, with the old familiar red livery giving way to unpainted aluminium. In the mid-1990s, this was enlivened with the addition of red and blue. Trains have terminated at Amersham since 1971, when the electric locomotives were withdrawn. Chiltern Railways, successors to BR on the line from Marylebone to Aylesbury and beyond, serve the stations beyond Amersham. At Amersham, we see one of the phenomena of the 1990s on the Metropolitan, the running of steam specials. The first locomotive of this pair is the old Metropolitan Railway No. 1, an 044 tank engine that was preserved at Quainton Road, home of the Buckinghamshire Railway Centre. The second engine is a Great Western-designed pannier tank, a type that was familiar at Paddington Station in British Railways days.
Also seen at Amersham are a British Railway Standard Class 4 tank and an LMS IVAT designed Class 2 mogul, both of which were types which may have worked over these lines at the end of British Railway steam days. Behind the LMS engine can be seen one of the original Metropolitan Electric locomotives, Sarah Siddons, preserved in working order and used on the steam trains to provide braking power, as the steam engines do not have braking compatible with the Metropolitan stock. The use of steam to attract publicity and increase the public's awareness of the Metropolitan system became a regular event around the May bank holiday each year from the beginning of the 1990s. The high point came in 1993 when a pair of Great Western panniers which had been bought by London Transport from British Railways in the mid-1960s returned to work the lines once again. Here they passed the site of the Croxley Tip, the traffic for which they had been purchased. Our final view of the Metropolitan now includes a modern successor to the Panniers, as well as one of the Panniers itself, an XBR Class 20 diesel, now used on Metropolitan Engineers trains. We've already looked at two railways whose existence depended upon coal. Now we look at one particular colliery in part of the country where an entire culture rested on the black mineral, South Wales. This is Mountain Ash in the Dared Valley, one of the famous coal valleys. It was a natural target for the enterprising Victorian railway entrepreneurs. Mountain Ash was home to an ex-Great Western pannier tank, number 7754. This locomotive was built by the North British Locomotive Company of Glasgow in 1930 and was only used on rare occasions. The crews disliked her. It was called the Animal by some, others called it the Cenotaph on account that it never moved. Mountain Ash had one of the largest internal user systems amongst the South Wales collieries. These views were recorded towards the end of its working life. Steam sold it on in industrial use for many years after it had ceased to be seen on the National British Railways network. The location was nearly at the northern limits of what was to become the Taff Vale Railway. Mountain Ash was first rail served by the Taff Vale's line via Pontypridd and Abercunnan on the line to Aberdeer from Cardiff in 1846. The railway map of South Wales, by the turn of the century, was covered with railway lines going up and down the valleys. With so many lines, their history, as might be expected, was complex. The Taffail line ran up the west bank of the Avon Cunnan. A rival Great Western line from the quaintly named Quaker's Yard ran along the east bank. This was to be the pattern for most of the coalfield, where rival companies served the collieries, and competition was intense. This part of Wales was festooned with collieries. Such was the demand for Welsh steam coal that by 1880, eight million tonnes a year were being shipped out through Butte docks in Cardiff. At the turn of the century, there were 27 collieries in the Dared Valley alone. By the time these views were filmed, only three collieries remained. These were Mountain Ash itself, Deep Dufferin and Penru Khyber. 
Coal was brought up the valley from Penbrook Khyber for washing at Abaraman, and then on to the Furnaceite plant there. In a sylvan setting, 060 saddle tank Sheer Gomel hurries a load of coal from Penrook Khyber bound for Mountain Ash. The locomotive was built by Peckets of Bristol in 1932. Works number 1859. It's next seen passing by the central workshops and colliery. Sheer Gomer is now bringing more loaded internal user wagons up to the Weybridge, on the site of the old Mountain Ash Cardiff Road, the old Great Western Station. On the shed roster, there were three turns in the mornings and two in the afternoon. This necessitated three engines in steam every working day. The engine shed had a huge fireplace that was piled high and ablaze with plentiful coal in summer as well as winter. A large blackened kettle was kept permanently on the boil for tea. The shed workers reckoned that the kettle had boiled continuously for 50 years. A cuppa was always at hand for parched enthusiasts. Sheer Gomel shunts a train before heading light engine towards Abaraman to pick up more empties. A diesel, probably one of the Abaraman Andrew Barclays, passes Mountain Ash's engine shed. This shed had two roads and could accommodate six engines. One occupant, Austerity 060 Saddle Tank No. 8, comes off shed with a full tank of water. She was originally built by Robert Stevenson of Newcastle in 1944, as their works number 7139. This engine was rebuilt by the Hunslet Engine Company of Leeds in 1961. It was one of the 484 tanks built to a war department design. 391 had been built for the WD, 93 were built for civilian use, mostly for the National Coal Board. Number 8 was an old war horse, being WD 5189, named Wren.
Number eight, nicknamed Puff Puff, gingerly pushes a wagon over a loose fish plate and prepares another train for the washery. Final view, Sheer Gomer brings the empty wagons down the line to Mountain Ash. A quarter of a century on, Mountain Ash has changed beyond all recognition. An all too familiar tale has to be told. The decimation of the coal industry has been as or more acute in South Wales than any other part of the country. Inevitably, Mountain Ash no longer resounds to the clanking of steel coupling rods or the crashing of buffers. Today, the only sounds of transport in the valley are from the motor vehicles as they swish along the new roads built to help the reinvigoration of an economy devastated by the elimination of its raison d'etre. Where there once were vast coal pit heads, acres of sorting sidings, and a complex rail system serving the collieries, there's now devastation. A coking plant still stands and is in use on the west side of the remaining rail tracks, which now serve only the local stations in the valley. The old slag heaps have been eliminated or landscaped, and the road users are blissfully unaware of what the pitiful few railway relics represent. A concrete bridge now has no purpose. Scattered and smashed concrete blocks and partially burnt wooden fencing are small reminders of what was once a busy complex. A few lamp standards escaped the Holocaust. The cinder paths were once track beds, and steel girders remain as mute testament to the enormous investment in an industry that was the backbone of a country through many generations. The message of hope for the future seems forlorn in the damp atmosphere, as Mountain Ash is rebuilt in the image of the late 20th century. Regeneration? A new generation will one day tell us whether the promises of those who destroyed one industry will ever return the valleys to prosperity. A Great Western Collet Goods engine at Evercreech Junction takes us back to an earlier generation of railway devastation. The Somerset and Dorset Railway was one of the much-loved rural cross-country railways that generated passions out of all proportion to their economic value. 
At the time these scenes were filmed, the railway was in its death throes, having been declared redundant by the Beeching Report. Despite a vociferous rearguard action, the Somerset and Dorset was to close on the 6th of March 1966. Two years before the end, on the 30th of March 1964, the now preserved 4F060 number 44422 runs light engine to Templecombe Station. Standard class 4 mogul number 76027 then pulls out with 44422 at the end of her train. This convoluted procedure was one of the charms of the S and D. Leaking steam like a Chinese laundry, standard class 4460, number 75071, then passes by. Now we are aboard a train setting out onto the Somerset and Dorset at Broadstone. Templecombe engine shed, coded 71H in 1955, is passed next, the date being the 18th of May 1964. Withdrawn Great Western engines are seen with number 44422 once again in steam at the end of the line. Evercreech Junction Yard and Turntable are next passed before Bath Green Park is reached. This part of the line was opened barely 90 years earlier, on the 20th of July 1874. Standard Class 4 Mogul 76019 backs onto the train at Bath Green Park. She's next seen departing from the delightful station of Evercreech Junction with its tall signal guarding the level crossing. 4F44422 is seen yet again arriving with a bath-bound train. These engines were a development of Fowler's earlier Midland design of 1911. The Whittaker tablet catcher can be seen on the tender. On the 3rd of March 1966, three days before closure, at Corf Mullen, 60 and three quarter miles from Bath, a standard class four mogul passes with a Bournemouth bound local. The train is one of the infrequent local trains which saw out the last two months of service on the line. Another standard class four follows, this time a 264 tank, number 80146. 80146, heading one of the by now rare freight trains, through freights were withdrawn in 1964, was to outlast the s &D, surviving to the end of Southern Steam in July 1967. On Saturday the 5th of March, Standard Class 4 Mogul number 76026 is seen once again near Blandford Forum. Mickey Mouse tanks 41307 and 41249 head a special near Wincanton bound for Bath. As the end neared, there were many such specials, as the S&D was dear to the heart of railway enthusiasts everywhere. Its history and, in particular, its closure were complex. Originally independent, it was latterly jointly owned and managed by the Southern and LMS railways. As such, it was a thorn in the side of the Great Western Railway. Under BR ownership in 1958, the Western region assumed control and the end was inevitable. The infamous Dr. Beeching's report was published in 1963 and recommended the entire S&D for closure. This is a last day but one special, hauled by Stania 8F number 48706, heading south. She only had two more months left to live, being scrapped at Butty Giggs Newport in May 1966. At the same location, an immaculate, unrebuilt bullied Pacific number 34006 Bude runs by light engine. She was to couple up to another immaculate Pacific, number 34057 Biggin Hill, to doublehead the Locomotive Club of Great Britain's Somerset and Dorset Rail Tour. What a magnificent sight. The two Pacifics exerting a total of 62,100 pounds of tractive effort, storming off out of Evercreech Junction. They were together in life and together in death, 34006 being scrapped in September and 34057 in December 1967, both by Cashmores of Newport. On this last day of normal services, locomotives were being run to the sheds at the end of the line to be ready for transfer to the scrapyards. So we have the contrast from two mighty Pacifics to two tanks on three coaches. 
Mickey Mouse tank number 41307 and standard class 4 tank number 80138 haul their lightweight load away from Evercreech. In the warm evening sunlight, 8F number 48706 hauls a returning special near Cole, heading north. Standard class 4 mogul number 76026 follows, heading south away from Cole Station. She was cut up at Cohen's Morriston in July 1967. One more local heads north with another of the versatile 8Fs. Our last view of the Somerset and Dorset main line sees 34006 Bude and 34057 Biggin Hill passing into the settling dust with the LCGB's Somerset and Dorset rail tour near Evercreech. One small part of the S&D was retained after closure to serve Rithlington Colliery. We go back to the 23rd of September 1965 in order to watch Jinty 060 tank number 47276 from Radstock as it shunts the sidings at Rithlington, one of the 16 collieries that at some stage were worked by the S&D. After closure of the main line, the colliery was served by BR Diesels until its own closure some seven years later on the 19th of November 1973. The Somerset and Dorset, known as the swift and delightful to its friends and the slow and dirty to its enemies, lives on today, but only in the memories of enthusiasts. Our review of the line now starts with one of the few remaining identifiable railway items in the yard at Evercreech Junction. We are looking towards the site of the turntable, where the Bath extension diverged from the original line to Burnham-on-Sea. Today the yard is a lorry park, it's accessed through the former station goods yard, which was situated behind the station buildings which survive on the left of our picture. The goods shed also survives, still in use for the storage of goods. No other railway artefacts exist, as might be expected some 30 years after closure. The site is operated as a private business and has been well converted for its present role. The station buildings have spent nearly a quarter of their existence in non-railway use and their robust construction has meant that there is little change since they last performed their design role. The main road where the level crossing once held up traffic at all times of the day now has a free passage, whilst the platforms have been submerged in a cottage garden only the platform edge paving stones are evidence of its former role. Another station house still exists a little further south, at Cole. However, the old station yard was being obliterated as part of Cole View when we visited it in 1996. From the road bridge, which has crossed nothing for 30 years, the view we had of the standard class 4 in 1966 is still just repeatable, but the housing development will soon obliterate even this. Such is the progress of time. The viaduct which an 8F crossed in the warm evening sunshine has long gone, as has the s &D bridge over the Great Western main line. That still carries trains. The course of the s &D has disappeared along much of its route, as is to be expected. But in some places it can be seen easily. This is Shepton Montague, just to the north of Wynne Canton, where we saw the last trains in 1966. From this angle, it's almost possible to see the double track on which the double-heading bullies ran and the two tanks headed just three coaches. 
the fence is very obviously of railway origin, and it's surprising that it hasn't been swept away and incorporated in the fields by now. Nothing remains of that short-term survivor Rithlington Colliery and its sidings. The track bed from here to Radstock is used as a footpath, although it hasn't been formally converted. Railway track ballast remains. The pathetic heap of debris marks the spot where the signal box once stood, behind which a barely visible path leads to the site of the colliery, itself impossible to identify. A crude warning notice forbids access to the old colliery site. A single sleeper, now supporting a gate that goes nowhere on the old track bed, is the last survivor. But did the spirit of the S and D really die? Standing on the original track bed, is it our imagination, or is that the cry of a true S&D 7F pounding over the Somerset Hills once again? In March 1996, 30 years after the Somerset and Dorset Railway was closed for good, its spirit was well and truly invoked on the preserved West Somerset Railway. Prominent amongst an array of true Somerset and Dorset motive power was the self-same 4F number 44422, which we saw at Templecombe and Evercreech Junction. It bore the numbers of some of its long-lost classmates during the event. 8F48706 was remembered on the Great Central, as were the Rithlington coal trains. One of the standard class 9F 210s, which were associated with the S&D near the end, still runs. Here seen on the S&D Gala on the mid Hants Railway. Standard Class 5s were popular on the S&D, and one which spent its entire existence on the railway was recalled in Somerset once again as 73052 headed a passenger train along the Bristol Channel coast, once the destination of all S&D trains.
But the real star, which keeps the Somerset and Dorset legend alive today, is the Class 7F number 53808, which also bore the numbers of its scrapped classmates in 1996. This engine is owned by the Somerset and Dorset Railway Trust, which exists to keep the interest in the railway alive. It has saved many artefacts and has a Somerset and Dorset Museum at Washford Station on the West Somerset Railway, maintaining an S&D presence in at least one of the counties the railway once served. These final scenes in our story of railways then and now serve to show how the souls of the railways of the steam era have been kept alive by the great preservation movement that was created by railway enthusiasts of the 1960s, who had grown up with the traditional railway scene. Their magnificent achievements, often in the face of official hostility and the you-can-never-do-that attitude of detractors, have ensured that future generations can go out and see for themselves how how it was then by seeing it now. We leave you with this magnificent sight. Is it now or then? Don't forget the other programmes that go to make up this series. There are also many other programmes available from Ian Allen which show the railways as they were then and now. Look out for the five decades of steam, covering steam railways from the 1920s to the end of steam in the 60s. Railway Roundabout, showing the railways of the 1950s and 60s as originally broadcast at the time on the BBC and the Ian Allen History of Britain's Railways, a four-part series chronicling the growth of railways in the country of their birth.